Swans can be scary, but here at Confident Care Academy, we don't believe that anything is hard, just unfamiliar. Today, we're gonna get into five easy tips for making swans simple. Before we dive into it, my name is Anna. I am a first year RRNA resident, registered nurse anesthetist, and I'm also co-founder of Confident Care Academy. I'm a former travel nurse and a current per diem PACU nurse, and I'll hand it to Chrissy. My name's Chrissy. I'm a current nurse anesthetist. I've been working for about five and a half years in this role. Before that, I was a CBICU nurse, and I also did a little bit of cardiac anesthesia as well. So swans is definitely something we're really excited to get into today and help demystify. So the first thing you absolutely need to know about any piece of equipment is the anatomy of the device that you're working with. Safety is really key, especially with the Swan Gains catheter, as we're going to get into more and more of the details about why, but it's a very invasive form of monitoring. And we're going to show a picture here of what the catheter itself looks like. It is a heparin coated 7.0 or 7.5 French uh, radio opaque polyvinyl catheter. There are little incision ports along the catheter that allow for medications to infuse and then exit the catheter at different points. And then there are also multiple different catheters within the catheter that do different things. So safety is really, really key here. And then in this slide, you can see where all of the different infusion catheters are within the Swan Gains catheter. You have a CVP port, a PA port, a thermistor port, a temperature monitoring port. And then depending on the brand and certain device that you're using, some will also have a CCO monitoring port. Um, most also will have the uh, VIP port. And then you will also, all of them are going to have the inflation balloon, which is very important for placement, which Christina knows a little bit more about placement. So important safety info about the SWAN. We wanna know how all of our ports work and where they terminate in the body. That way we use it appropriately and don't accidentally push drugs through the same location or through the wrong location, I'm sorry. First and foremost, our VIP port stands for the vasoactive infusion port. This is where you're gonna be running your vasopressors through and if your patient's coming up from the OR, it might already be hooked up this way. Um, the VIP port is the first so before we even talk about where ports terminate, something that I didn't really understand as a new grad nurse is how do these ports all end in different directions? I didn't realize that for triple lumen um, central lines and for swans, all these multi-lumen central venous devices, that it's actually a series or a bundle of separate catheters that are all bundled with one external sheath, like one giant straw or cover wrapped around a pile of multiple different strands and they all have holes that release medications into different places. So for the VIP port, it's the first hole that's going to release medications and it's at the cavo atrial junction or just before the right atrium where the superior vena cava, the SVC, connects and dumps blood in from the upper half of the body. This is where our central lines typically infuse medications. So you can remember it that way that this is going to be very similar to any central line that you normally use for vasoactives. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Yes, usually this port is white and it makes a lot of sense that this is where we're trying to give most of our medications and fluids because why does a patient have a swan gains catheter? usually because they have a very sick heart and you're trying to get a lot of very specific cardiac measurements. So it makes sense that you're not trying to infuse most of your port, uh, most of your medications farther down on different ports, because again, you're trying to get very sensitive measurements from the heart. So you're giving medications through the VIP port and it terminates above the heart and the superior vena cava, or what is the junction you said, Chrissy? The cava atrial junction. Oh, that makes sense. I love it. Yeah. And then do you want to talk about the CVP a little bit, Chrissy? Yeah. So CVP is the second place that you are technically allowed to push medications through. Like in an emergency, if you run out of access, you can definitely push medications through the CVP port. This is typically blue. Um, the thing is, we don't want to be running continuous medications through it unless you're really, really, really in a pinch. Because again, just like Anna already said, that's going to interfere with our ability to measure the pressure in the right atrium. So we'll talk a little bit later on in this episode about what CVP is actually measuring. We're not measuring preload. We're not measuring fluid status. We are measuring stretch in the heart, but we'll again, circle back to that. Um, and those are the only two places we really ever wanna be infusing medications through. 
The third port to know about, the PA, is going to end in the pulmonary artery. It's going to have a lumen open, a hole open in the pulmonary artery so that we can measure pulmonary artery pressure. And that's the primary reason that we're going to be using a Swan-Ganz catheter in the first place. We're concerned about a patient that has high pulmonary artery pressures, a patient in right heart failure, um, or a patient who's fresh out of maybe a very invasive open heart surgery, who is going to need a very close eye on all the different pressures in the heart as we're looking for various complications. Just clarifying for new grad nurses who are dealing with Swankin's catheters for the first time. So you've got probably, it's N plus one is the <laughs> number of medications that you're gonna need to give through a central line in these really critical patients. So when you're thinking about what meds go where, okay, if you have extended, it, um, like extended release vancomycin that's gonna go in over five hours, you're not gonna choose to give that medication through the CVP in a patient where you were trying to get really accurate cardiac numbers every hour. You're going to try to get a peripheral IV for the extended release zosin or vancomycin. And then you can give something that's like very short, like maybe a calcium gluconate through a CVP if it's like less than 30 minutes or ideally even like a push situation. So just kind of like starting to think about as a new grad, like, okay, well, like what, or as a new cardiac nurse, like, what am I going to use which lines for and how am I going to get all my medications in in a way that's going to like be the best for the patient and for the team so that we can get the numbers that we're looking for. And then now we're moving on to the next thing. Yeah. No, no, I love it. That was perfect. That was great. Yeah. And again, like just reinforcing what you said, figuring that out in the beginning of your shift and setting yourself up for success mm -hmm. by planning purples early. Like you notice this when you do your AM assessment or change of shift assessment, you can, you know, go through your first med pass, your assessment, get your charting done. The second you finally have downtime, like you should be working on getting that peripheral or figuring out a plan or something like that earlier on in the shift so you don't get caught in a pinch later in the day. Um, this really circles back to one of our earliest lectures about being new in the ICU and time management. So go back and check out that podcast episode if you haven't heard it yet, because we really talk about planning your day as an ICU nurse. And then you want to be looking ahead and never playing catch up, just kind of putting out fires because this was predictable. You have a ton of medications and you need to get an additional peripheral IV. A quick assessment would have told you that instead of suddenly it's 1030 AM and you've got three medications that are late and you're scrambling, trying to find the ultrasound guided IV nurse because you're not certified to do it yet. So go check, go back and check out that episode. I think that's really good. A review for really everybody is just like how to manage your day. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. And that was probably one of the hardest things for me to learn as a new grad nurse. Yeah, um, the next thing that you guys should know about, especially for safety, is the inflation lumen, the balloon on the mm. swan Gans catheter. So we use this term a lot called floating a swan. Floating a swan means that we are inflating a balloon at the end of it, and we are advancing it through the neck, all the way into the right atrium, all the way into the right ventricle, all the way down into the pulmonary artery, and it's gonna end. It's gonna end in the PA, right? And once we're in the, half, the spot that we're happy with, we take down the balloon. We never want to leave the balloon inflated because that can get wedged, stuck into the PA, herniate the pulmonary artery, cause ischemia to it. It could even rupture it if it gets shoved in too far. This could kill your patient. So we use it to advance the catheter and we also use it to get pulmonary artery wedge pressures, PAOP pulmonary artery occlusion pressure is the other word for it. So it might be called a wedge, a PAOP, both those terms are- It's either occlusion or wedge. Yeah, it, it means the same thing, yeah. yeah. But, um, so the point is that like that balloon can cause harm to the patient. So we wanna know how to use it. There should always be a syringe attached to it that comes with the swan kit. It's a special syringe that has a maximum amount of air that you can give. So you're never hooking up a 10 ml syringe you're never hooking up a five ml syringe, you're only leaving on the syringe that comes with the swan. Um, what I- And this should be a part of your safety checks. This, one of the first things you do when you come in the room is checking to make sure that that catheter is locked and that the balloon is deflated. Um, not that you don't trust the people who come before or after you, this is just a part of your daily practice as you're assessing these patients. So here's an important point. How do you know that the balloon is deflated? The first thing you should do is make sure that, okay, you take the syringe off. 
You unscrew it and shoot out any air that's in there. Lock the syringe. Not off. into the patient. <laughs> you yeah, are well, not going said, yeah, to push. The syringe push. is off, right? Yeah. The syringe is not connected. The syringe is in the air, and you squirt out any air that you find, and then you reconnect it to the swan. You unlock it so that the two red lines line up, and you pull back on the plunger so that you're making sure that there's no air that you're drawing back into the syringe. While it's pulled back, you lock it again. Voila, there's no air in your balloon. Um, there's two trains of thought and two philosophies on this, and it's kind of funny because anesthesia and nursing have like opposite philosophies typically. So in <laughs> anesthesia, a lot of times to signify that there's no air in the swan, they like to leave the air in the syringe because a lot of times we're constantly adjusting the swan. We're inflating the balloon, we're advancing it, we're deflating the balloon, we're pulling it back. So to tell the person who's taking over for me or giving me a break or to remind myself that the balloon is down, we leave the air in the syringe and lock it. Nursing has the opposite philosophy. They're like, ooh, well, what if it accidentally becomes unlocked and then you could accidentally push it and wedge the patient, especially since we're turning the patient so often, they could roll onto it, it could accidentally wedge and then no one would know. I think that as an ICU nurse, that makes a lot of sense based on like your workflow of your day and that's what you should stick with and that's what I recommend. Um, but if your patient comes up from anesthesia with the syringe looking the other way, it's not because we're like a bunch of rogue wild animals, it's because this is practical and safe for us. Like it's safe for different reasons. Our patient is not wiggling around, moving around and turning. They are so, paralyzed and in a bed and we're actively controlling it at all times. Question for you. Do you change that at all if you're leaving the room and you're being given a break? No, no I mean, I definitely makes... not because it will actually scare okay. the next anesthesia provider. They'll be like, oh my God, is it wedged? Like they'll think the opposite of what you're used to thinking. They'll, they'll freak out. Very <laughs> interesting. Yeah. So it makes sense, I think, just because, again, in the ICU, you're turning patients, they're awake, they're likely not paralyzed and sedated. Um, and then because there's more chance to dislodge it, it, I think it does make sense the way that we do it with the, like, making sure it's deflated and then making sure there's no air in the syringe. I think the converse also makes sense because you are in the OR with much tighter control and you're not doing those handoffs and the patient isn't mobile. I think that's just interesting. I think it's two sides of the same coin. Like both you're trying to like have little safeguards in place. They're just kind of the opposite. Yeah, exactly. Of each other. A different environment <laughs> needs different safeguards. So it's always important to critically think about these things. So again, you don't need to safety net us or report us when we come up from the OR and like there's some air in the syringe. I've seen Sounds like before. this is from personal experience, <laughs> Chrissy. Is this is this I'm from personal saying, experience? Um, I'm just saying, you're wrong. But, <laughs> but no, it's just, uh, actually it hasn't happened to me, but it has happened to my colleagues and it makes me laugh every time. I'm like, that's because you were rude. You never get safety netted if you're nice. I'm just throwing it out there. <laughs> you're rude, this so you're going to get safety This is true. Beer. But the air is not a big deal. You can just safety net them for being rude, which is appropriate. Anyway, um, <laughs> our other ports on the swan if you are lucky enough to have a continuous cardiac output monitoring swan, they are a blessing from the heavens. It is the CCO cable. It's not really a port, right? It's not like we're injecting anything through it, but it is um, like a fiber optic cable that's going to transmit the information from the swan back to our swan box, our continuous output monitoring box, so we can get continuous feedback on um, you know, our cardiac output, our cardiac index, even our SVO2, which we'll talk about later when we get into in the Competent Care Academy membership lectures, we go like deep into that. Um, and then the last one is the thermistor. It's your temperature monitor. So again, like just the fiber optic feedback cable. We have coils at the end of the swan that monitor temperature and we'll get into like how that actually works. But, um, you know, you'll plug that into the swan box and you'll get a nice core temp from that. And then I just wanted to reiterate that this is not our SWANS lecture. We're chatting about it. I think it's helpful in podcast format. The full lecture is in the membership. I think it's like 30 something slides <laughs> and we go very, very deep. Yeah, we go down into all of the waveforms, talking about the CVP waveform, talking about floating the SWAN, talking about thermodilution versus FIC for <laughs> getting car cardiac indexes. So join us over there if you want that deeper dive. Today we are talking about kind of general safety considerations and then just lived experiences as well because Chrissy has done cardiac anesthesia and was a former CVICU nurse. I am, I don't know, am I former? I think I'm a former CVICU nurse at this yeah, point. Because if I were, at this point. I, <laughs> I think a former at this point. So join us over there for the deeper dive. But then uh, this is where we're gonna gonna talk about the topics a little bit here too. 
So one of the things you're going to work the most closely with on a Swan Gaines catheter is the CVP measurement. And there's a lot of kind of misinformation in the way that we teach nurses to both read, monitor, and what the CVP is actually doing and actually reading and actually monitoring. So we can kind of talk about that a little bit. So the CVP uh, is one of the first exit ports along the path of the Swan Gaines catheter, and it sits in the right atrium. So CVP, what we're looking for is how the function of the right side of the heart is doing. Specifically, we're looking to see hemodynamic measurements of what's happening in the right atrium. Um, at that point, what we're looking for is the ability of the right side of the heart to stretch. And by stretch, it's actually an active, um, it's, a, it's an active action. So a lot of times I think we think about diastole and filling as something that's passive, but it is not. You actually have to place a lot of energy along these tiny little cardiac myocytes to stretch, and that is like an active um, engagement. And this is something that we talk about in the other lectures too, is that the filling and the stretching of the heart is actually like an active action, which is really interesting. So then when we're looking at CVP, what we're looking at is the ability of the right atrium to stretch, which is related, but not the same thing as preload, which I think that's something that's not always communicated very well. A lot of times you hear, even in cardiac ICUs, oh, their CVP is low, they're dry, ah, meaning <laughs> that they're trying to like, they're trying to like, <laughs> they're trying to chase a CVP ah, with fluid, which is not something that is, no, like, we're not gonna do that. It's too normal. Let's put them into a little <laughs> bit of heart failure so that it makes me feel better, so it matches the rest of our patient population who all has heart failure. Like, no! <laughs> And then you have to diurese oh, it all off later. So even in the cardiac ICU that I was trained at, we had older nurses who would say like things along the lines of like, oh, well, extra squeezes, like extra fluid boluses, those are free, don't chart those. Do not do that in cardiac patients. We over resuscitate. Fluids are not benign. And then making your numbers, like making your CVP look higher is actually going to hurt most of these patients because they are all there because they needed open heart surgery. Like none of these people have a healthy heart. Do not give them too many fluids because you will make the whole situation worse. So they're going to be chasing that and diuresing for Another days to weeks common. later. So do not give too Another much common. fluid. So I was also taught the same thing. I was always, I was always taught to document half of the fluid I gave and I'm like horrified. Half? And like, no. Half. And I'm like, That's awful. Like, <laughs> gave those patients so much fluid and then they all needed so much diuresis later. And I'm like, I'm just horrified at the whole thing. Anyway, but um, the sec- And this really starts with nursing. Like this is a nursing education thing and this is a nursing education so flaw. People because if the team people. doesn't know that nursing is giving, if yeah, if the medical team and the APP team doesn't know that nursing is giving twice the fluids that they're telling the team, that doesn't give them the opportunity to work together and fluids are not going to fix uh, it's not going to heart failure. Problems. It's actually going to make it right. way worse. But, okay, so, so, so. Yeah, very true. So don't give, don't don't give extracurricular fluids and document everything that you get and talk not about just, these things. And CVP is not CVP the same as preload. Okay, so, going, so like a little bit more. Another back to CVP. That I learned was what's a normal CVP. In CVICUs, a lot of times we'll be like, oh, normal CVP is like seven to ten. They'll say like eight to, eight to twelve. Yeah, you get a range like that. Like. No, that's literally not a normal yeah. CVP. A normal CVP, CVP is like zero to six. So we're just used to seeing, like yeah. that is something that's like quote unquote normal to us because all of our patients, their hearts are a little messed up. And we're also typically measuring it on patients who have positive pressure ventilation, right? So extra increased intrathoracic pressure from positive pressure ventilation, from PEEP that we're giving, um, plus them having like a little bit of a sick heart at baseline, means that our patient population, we tend to see CVPs in that like seven to 10, eight to 12 range, but that's not normal. And it's definitely not a number we should strive for or try to chase. Like that is just like so far off from the truth. It's like, it makes my head want to spin. It's not a measure of perfusion. It's not a measure of perfusion, it's not a measure it's not of perfusion at all. all. So like, what are some things that like <laughs> affect CVP? Like what are other things that CVP could measure, right? Like let's yeah. give you some tangibles so that we're not just confusing you more. So it's a measure of the right atrial pressure, right? The pressure in the right atrium. So what are things that can affect that? Yes, preload, 
the amount, like the patient's fluid status, the patient's vascular tone, right? If you have a completely vasodilated patient in shock, they lose their preload because there's no more um, squeeze bringing the fluid back to the heart, right? So it has an indirect, um, it's indirectly affected by intravascular fluid tone, it's it fluid volume, it's indirectly a measure of, not a measure of, uh, affected by venous capacitance. It's um, an indirect result of mean systemic filling pressure. It's an indirect result of any increased intrathoracic pressure. So if you have a patient in ARDS and they're on like 10 a P, 15 a P or like some like APRV mode or bi-level and they're getting like really high pressures on the vent in order to recruit those lungs, they have all that extra increased intrathoracic pressure, you can expect to see the CVP go higher. Does that mean that the patient is fluid volume overloaded? No. Does it mean that they have like a ton of extra preload in that scenario? No, it means there's just more pressure there. So these are like all just different things that are affecting it. And it could be a sign of increased intra-abdominal pressure. So you have a patient who was yep. a trauma, they were stabbed in the liver that day, or they just got a liver transplant, or they had an X lab for ischemic bowel, and we're worried about abdominal compartment syndrome. They go up to the you that night, they happen to have a swan in for whatever reason. Usually this would be like, I guess a liver transplant, but again, swans are getting less and less popular. So you guys are gonna see this less often, but who knows? Maybe your patient that already has a swan has ischemic gut, right? And then that night they come back up, the belly's closed, and all of a sudden the CVP skyrockets out of nowhere. Your patient might be getting abdominal compartment syndrome. All of a sudden that increased abdominal pressure is being reflected in the right side of the heart. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden your patient's fluid volume overloaded, right? So these are like different ways to think about it. Like there's so many things that go into what the CVP is. Um, also, if your patient has really severe pulmonary hypertension, that's leading to a backup of like really bad tricuspid regurgitation, right? The valve, the opening and closing, that the, the piece of tissue that opens and closes and separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. As your pulmonary artery pressure goes up, it's gonna be harder to offload the, the blood from the right side of the heart into the PAs it's going to get backloaded. It's going to backload into the tricuspid valve. You're gonna eventually develop tricuspid regurgitation or maybe after a heart attack, um, a muscle that controls that valve, a papillary muscle ruptures, and you get wide open tricuspid regurgitation. And now blood is flowing backwards into the right atrium, your CVP is gonna be up. So these are like all different things that can affect that number. Whew. And I think the big picture that we're trying to get critical care nurses to think about is just that it's all connected and i think we very much teach nursing school in a very isolated way like you're doing your cardiac month and then you're doing your respiratory month but i don't think that i really understood that when a patient goes into mods like multi-system organ failure that you progress from like left-sided heart failure you end up with poor uh, AV, uh, you end up with poor lung function and then the blood is not able to do gas exchange very well and then you end up with right-sided heart failure and then that backs up and then you end up with liver congestion and then you end up with uh, wild blood sugar swings and then your kidneys. So like I think the picture that it's really helpful for new grads to do is to actually like sit down and to draw things out and then to see what might affect what measurement because that's really what the swan is there for it tells us a lot about the left side and the right side of the heart and that is really helpful for new grads and i think for just like all critical care nurses to be able to try to visualize what's happening and really not just icu nurses and not just critical care nurses but also like people who are looking to apply to crna school you're going to get some questions about a swan gains catheter even if you're not a icu a cvicu nurse you're probably going to yeah, get a question like about a cvp waveform so it's really good to draw too. it out like, even if you're not yep. um, a cvicu nurse or a ccu nurse you are still monitoring cvp in a lot of your patients through the central line like your triple elements a lot of people are still transducing a cvp yep. off of that so it's still important to understand like this is not what we're going to guide our fluid resuscitation by um should be the take-home point and like, you know, arrhythmias, again, valve regurgitation, pulmonary hypertension, increased intrathoracic pressure. There's like a million things that can cause changes in your CVP. So when you see an acute change in your CVP or a really, really high CVP, um, instead of just thinking it must be catheter error, <clears throat> think about the things it could be and talk it through with the team. You might find that you'll learn a lot. I really like what Chrissy said. Definitely talk with the team. I remember 
one of our cardiac anesthesiologists who was one of the intensivists at the first staff nursing job that I was at, who are my favorite type of intensivists, by the way. I, <laughs> I'm also partial. <laughs> I am a little biased because I'm on the anesthesia track myself, but I just think that a lot of them really have a heart for teaching and they're also very, very good at pain control, sedation, and then also hemodynamic yeah. management because the they are the an anesthesiologist, yeah. which is, uh, it's so good. But I remember being a new grad and then talking to my intensivist, who was a cardiac anesthesiologist, about a patient who was progressing into some pretty severe right-sided heart failure. And then he just walked me through the steps of what we might expect and then gave me time to think about it before I would give an answer and like giving space as a learner to be able to kind of reason through what happens in the heart was, I, I'll never forget that. Like it's year, it's like three years later now. And I remember that he was kind and took the time to like walk through the steps of profound right-sided heart failure with me. That sort of thing is so interesting because again, with the heart, it's a pump. Like you can figure out what's happening if you draw it out or if you can mentally picture it. And that's why we're using the Swan Gaines catheter is to really get a lot of information about the heart, which Chrissy, do you want to talk about more information? Other things yeah, that you can find so, out? Like our, okay. So what we told, we told you we're going to do like five tips to make swans easy, right? Our first tip was like safety. Like don't push drugs yeah. to the wrong place. Don't accidentally wedge the balloon. Cool. We got <laughs> that. All right. Second thing was like understanding the CVP. Don't use it to like over resuscitate your patient. Cool. Number three, understand the PA waveform. What is the point of the PA waveform? Understand why we're doing it. And just like keep in mind some safety tips when, if, if you are asked to wedge the patient. Some places only providers wedge patients. Some places nursing does it. Some places people are still getting wedge numbers every four hours like as a standing order. And some people only do it like when the heart failure team comes by. So like a wedge is not a number you're gonna get yourself. You're gonna make sure it's in like a protocol or an order and you do with like a charge nurse with you like the first couple of times you do it. but before we get to the wedge, let's talk about what the P is. It's important, like, I think that like demystifying these things is just gonna make your life a lot easier. So, um, where does totally the P agree. measure from? Like all the way to the tip of the catheter, right? The catheter tip is sitting in the pulmonary artery. So it's like the very last hole, the very last opening, all the way at the end. Um, it's going to, again, it's chilling in the pulmonary artery. And what's interesting, I don't think I really understood this, like until, I don't know, I guess I just like never thought about it before when I was a nurse or maybe I did and I forgot and then I relearned it, who knows. But there's no valves in between the pulmonary artery and the left atrium. Like the pulmonary artery receives blood from the right side of the heart and then it brings blood into the lungs and then the lungs feed the blood into the pulmonary veins and then they just dump everything into the left atrium of the heart. So during left ventricular diastole when the mitral valve opens what's the mitral valve it's the little piece of tissue that separates the left atrium from the left ventricle when that flap is open you get a direct look at the filling pressures of the left ventricle in theory unless something really funky is going on with like the heart's anatomy so um we can look at the pa diastolic pressure the pressure during diastole and know what the left ventricular filling pressures are. So this gives us really similar information to what we get on the right side of the heart. It's gonna tell us if there's something severely wrong, if we're having an acute episode of CHF, like if all of a sudden the LV is like not able to pump, the pressures go really, really high, the fluid's not getting out, like that's like a nice clue for us. Um, most of the time, again, we're, use, we're usually using the PA to measure the pulmonary artery pressure itself. A lot of our cardiac surgery patients, um, our lung transplant patients, they have pulmonary hypertension. Sometimes it's idiopathic, sometimes it's caused by the heart failure. Um, sometimes it's like a primary disease process. There's like lots of different causes for it. Um, our heart transplant patients, this is like a really important number to look at. But for whatever reasons, you know, we get into measuring this number, it's important to control. If your patient comes out of heart surgery and they have really high PA pressures, they're going to cause right-sided heart failure. A lot of times it's hard to give adequate protection to the right side of the heart when we're on bypass. Um, we try to arrest the heart, um, for, you know, we could, that's like a whole nother lecture, but we try to arrest the heart during open heart surgery in order to um, decrease oxygen consumption. 
but you know it's a little bit harder to fully arrest the right side of the heart than the left and so the right side of the heart tends to take a little bit of a hit um, because it will be using up a little bit more oxygen and get a little bit more ischemia so oftentimes it's stunned and we need to give the right heart a lot of support when we come off of bypass and we freshly bring up the patient to the icu so this is like a big reason why pa catheters still live on even though you know the non-invasives are claimed to be just as good uh, if you work in a center that has very high acuity open heart surgery patients, um, it's going to be, I think we're all very afraid to step away from that level of detail because those small changes can give us really early warning signs of if something's going down with your fresh cabbage, with your heart transplant patient, with your fresh mitral valve, tricuspid valve repair patient. So these are like little clues that can really mean the difference between life and death. So I think we're all a little bit afraid to give up that control. Which really brings us to the next tip, which is talking about cardiac output and cardiac index, and then why the SWAN is sometimes it's still used at these large tertiary centers. And it's like we talked about, and then we talked about this in the lecture as well. There's mixed evidence about utilizing SWAN gains catheters slash pulmonary artery catheters, but it's difficult to differentiate because, again, certain patient populations only end up at certain centers and then these patients are much 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 sicker they're likely to have more adverse outcomes so it's difficult to separate and tease out differences in outcomes in acutely ill patients and we talked about this a little bit in the vasopressin lecture as well there are people will hotly debate <laughs> giving only 0.04 units of vasopressin, which is not dose, uh, which is not weight based, which is interesting. And then it's also typically at least a second line agent, which again is just difficult to differentiate outcomes in really critically <laughs> ill patients, like or, or even a third line. Like, so oh, what's... <laughs> like, let me randomize this almost dead person right. with this other almost dead person at this slight dosage difference and see like who did better. Oh, well, like, they did a it's little bit It's very hard to study. Okay. It's, like, what does that mean? <laughs> that's very difficult because, again, at what point are they randomized into receiving versus not receiving? Is it ethical to withhold a third-line agent in a patient who is heading into MODs? It's difficult to study critically ill patients, and I think some of that is at play with swan gains catheters because patients who are, again, sick enough to be receiving a heart transplant or a multivessel cabbage plus multiple valves, it, it's difficult to say some of the research is kind of muddy, but it, they're critically ill patients. But that does get into swan gains catheters, tip number four, understanding what we're looking at in terms of cardiac index and cardiac output, and then um, also mixed venous blood gases. And we talk about this much more in depth in the lecture, but I do think this is one of the most interesting parts about utilizing this piece of equipment is the cardiac index measuring and the mixed venous gas gases and what that tells us about the heart because i think this is so it so 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 interesting do you want to take this one away Anna? <laughs> yeah sure so cardiac output is stroke volume stroke volume times heart rate however uh, that doesn't take into account body surface area or the size of the patient so we usually use cardiac index which is the same calculation but it's taking into account body surface area for the patient so it's more accurate. Uh, we want it to be greater than 2.3 in every patient, but in these really, really sick cardiac patients, we're really shooting oftentimes for just greater than two. This is gonna be physician specific, it's gonna be center specific, but broadly speaking, you're looking for a cardiac index of greater than at least two before you're gonna come down on inotropic support for patients. So we talk about this really in depth in the lecture, the difference between a VBG and a mixed venous blood gas and what that tells us. Something that I learned when I was writing some of these slides is that when you're drawing a VBG from the CVP port inside of the swan gains catheter is that it's more reflective of the venous return to the body from the head and neck and less reflective of how much oxygen the body is extracting systemically. So I think that's really interesting that if you're pulling from the RA then it's not necessarily reflective of like, you know, the kidneys and like skeletal muscle and all this other stuff. So that that's really interesting. And then the, when we say a mixed venous blood gas, we're drawing from that pulmonary artery catheter and it's called mixed because that is where all of the deoxygenated blood is mixed around in the heart and the right atrium and the left, um, sorry, right atrium and the right ventricle. And then it gets pushed into the pulmonary artery 
it's all mixed and then that is where we are drawing off the um the sample to send off to the lab and then that tells us a lot about how sick the heart is how much oxygen the heart is requiring and then also how sick the body is and we can tell a lot about how much the whole body is needing oxygen wise and about the heart from a mixed venous blood gas and i think this is so 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 interesting if you want to talk about or yeah, elaborate a little no, bit more it's so funny because like svo2 like i think i kind of understood at the time like or i would say like I, I understood that it had to do with oxygen extraction right like okay the tissues in the body are utilizing oxygen so like uh you know ideally we want the number to be like around 75 and it kind of like surprised me the first time someone explained to me that like a high SVO2 is bad. Like if it's like greater than 80, like an eight, if it all says like 85, 90, you're like, what's going on? Like, why are the tissues not using oxygen? Um, a lot of times it could be an early warning sign of something like sepsis, which, you know, that's a whole nother lecture once again. But, um, and then again, if the SVO2 suddenly drops very low, whoa, why is the body like extracting so much oxygen? Like this is like a disproportionate amount of oxygen that it's like taking out of the blood that it normally would. Um, and that's a sign that cardiac output is not meeting your tissue demands. Our body is able to compensate for that by extracting more oxygen. So when we're measuring a mixed venous blood gas, in order to get this number, we're looking and seeing if like, cardiac output is meeting tissue demands. That's like the main goal of this. Um, if you are lucky and have a fancy swan box and a fancy swan catheter, you calibrate it when you first get it, you calibrate it with like a real mixed venous blood sample. Um, you run it on like your super gas as a venous blood gas, and then you um, pop in the hemoglobin, and then you'll be able, the swan gas catheter will be able to give you continuous monitoring numbers of the SVO2, which is awesome. So like you can see your patient which it's is so best. awesome like your patient's in bed right the first night after surgery typically and then in the morning we usually what get them out of up to, up to bed to chair if you look at your swan box like right before you get them up and then like right when you sit them down if your patient is still on a few pressers you get them successfully to the chair and then their svo2 drops from like 70 to 50 you're like whoa like that little amount of activity caused the patient to need to extract a lot more oxygen their cardiac output wasn't ready to handle that yet Maybe we need to go slow on weaning the vasopressors. We really need lots more continuous, uh, we need more cardiac output support. We need more ionotropy or whatever it is. Um, that's another good time to also look at your patient's hemoglobin. What was their more recent hemoglobin? Another reason mm -hmm. this could happen is like, maybe there's just not enough oxygen carrying capacity floating around in the blood. Like maybe they need a unit of blood. Um, obviously like- Which again, LR doesn't carry oxygen. We get so, these big crystalloid <laughs> in patients like and this, like their hemoglobin yes. seven, and we're like, well, based on that one study, that one time, like seven should be our transfusion threshold cutoff. But like, well, maybe in some patients, like they do need a unit of blood, right? Like guidelines are great, but we should always, they never supersede clinical judgment. Look and, at the like, patient. What's going on with the patient. So if your patient's SpO2 is dropping when they get out of bed to chair, this is something to talk to the team about and say like, hey, do you think we need to like, hey, their, their hemoglobin's like 7.8 and their SVO2 drops getting out of bed and I can't wean the FU off. Like, I really liked the way that I was taught to think about weaning inotropic support after cardiac surgery for patients. And it's all about forward flow. Is the heart squeezing hard enough to give the body all of the oxygen and blood that it needs? And then what are the signs of perfusion? So I was taught as I'm coming down off of my dobutamine or my epinephrine, and we have lots of lectures in the pharmacology library, go check those lectures out. We'll have them linked up here if you're watching the video version of this. But so a couple of the swan gains catheter measurements that are, you're using in consolation with all of the other things that are happening are you're looking at your cardiac index. So is your cardiac index greater than like 2.2? And is your mixed venous blood gas greater than like 65 or 70? Like usually like you're shooting for like greater than 65 or 70, but if they're really sick, it might be lower than that. So if you come down on your epinephrine and your cardiac index remains solid and your mixed venous blood gas stays solid and they're making urine and their cap refill is good and they look like they're perfusing clinically because it's not all just numbers, you're not just chasing numbers, you're actually looking at the patient. That's telling you a lot, uh, exactly. Or are they cold, pale, and clammy, right? So you're gonna wait as you're, 
like if you have a swan gains catheter, use it. And what is it telling you? It's telling you how the forward flow is, it's telling you about all of the pressures within the heart, it's telling you indirectly about afterload, indirectly about preload, and also pretty directly in the form of the mixed venous blood gas, oxygen extraction and demand by the body, which is awesome. So then you can use that to guide coming down off of your vasopressors, which is something that nurses do, which is really cool that that's in our scope of practice. I think that that's really interesting to use all of these tools at your disposal. And why does a hemoglobin matter? We talk about this in the lecture, but there's a calculation to calculate cardiac index and it's, if you're using your CCO, then it's automatically done for you, but you can also do it by FIC. And then this talks about like the AA like gradient, I believe your hemoglobin carrying capacity and like the size of the patient. It's like a whole long calculation that you can plug it in, but you do need to know the patient's hemoglobin in order to get an accurate cardiac index. And that's something that we do care about in this patient population. You can check out the lecture for more. That's deeper than we're going to go here. Rears its ugly head again in the respiratory physiology lecture coming up. Um, <laughs> like much to my oh, yes. like, dismay, I was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe I have to do this again." But you know, here we are. <laughs> so don't worry, more lots of we can never escape cardiac. Right. Anyway, so um, <laughs> all right, so this brings us to our fifth and final demystifying swan tips, and this is you might be asked to help insert the swan and you're definitely going to be asked if you're in a CBICU or CCU to remove swan. So how do you assist with floating swans safely and how do you remove them safely? These are like, you know, one of like the things that I think we emphasize the least and yet it's so- It's actually high so risk too. When you're floating like, a swan- They're just like, <laughs> they're like, oh, you can pull the swan, right? And you're like, like it oh, might be a traveler who's actually not signed off on that. And then if the balloon is inflated, anyway, there's some nur nursing safety things here that we're gonna just go over <laughs> to help set you up for success. Yeah, maybe let's, let's talk about pulling, pulling the swan before we talk about inserting the swan. Cause pulling the swan is yeah. super common, right? Like you wean them off pressers and like they look great and they're making urine and everybody's happy and they're talking and they're eating breakfast. Like great, pull the swan, send them to the, to, to the step down unit, right? So first things first, like Anna already alluded to, we wanna make sure the balloon's down. How do we make sure the balloon's down? You're going to make sure that it is unlocked. You're gonna line up the little red arrows. You're gonna pull back on the plunger. Make sure you lock it again. Everybody's happy. Okay, balloon's down. You want your patient in bed for this because even though most times we have the cordis that has, um, that we float the swan through, it has like a little valve in it so that as soon as you pull out the swan, it like closes so that air can't get entrained. It's still just good practice to have the patient laying in bed when you're pulling any sort of central line out of the neck, just in case something funky happens, we don't want air to entrain into the patient. Um, when you're pulling central lines, similar concept. Um, some people put the bed in Trendelenburg. Some people have the patient um, either blow out or hum, and that way we don't accidentally entrain air when we're like, exposing giant holes in the neck. Um, so that's like the second thing. The other thing is you don't wanna pull against resistance. Like you're gonna feel a little bit of stiffness or a little bit of resistance when it's coming out, but if you feel like it's stuck, stop what you're doing, like just stop. And I don't wanna hear anybody getting like bullied into pulling anyway. Every now and then you hear a story about, you know, sometimes during open heart surgery, accidentally a stitch could get wrapped around the swan the heart is closed. There's no way for us to see that on echo or x-ray. It's not until we go to pull the swan and tug it that the stitch is found. Um, people have been known to pull hard and tear the heart and kill patients. So we don't want that. Um, if, it, if it's stuck, just stop what you're doing and you need to contact cardiac surgery. Um, at the end of our open heart surgeries, especially our mitral valve repairs, um, and like, and just really actually any open heart surgery, we usually do this. We will um, like practice like wiggling the swan like before everything's totally closed. And like before we start closing the chest like with the cardiac surgeon there. So that like, make sure <laughs> we're essentially checking to make sure that didn't happen. That's like one of our safety checks. That's valid. So it is a theoretical possibility, although rare. Um, yeah. So yeah. Do you, wanna, do you want me to go into floating the swan? Yeah, so pulling or sure? floating. Yeah, sure. So floating. When you're floating a swan, you are probably going to want to check with a charge nurse because you don't want to do a procedure like this with a provider by yourself. So just word to the wise, 
every time you're doing something and it's the first time you've ever done it, just bring someone else in there. You don't ever want to be alone. Like there's no reason. You don't become a better nurse by doing things solo. You actually become a better nurse by learning from other people who have done things many times before. So your first couple times, just grab someone else to have them in the room with you. You're going to want to grab three pressure cables. You're going to have one for the PA waveform, one for the art line waveform, one for the CVP waveform. This is, it well, also depends if they're also play, placing an art line at the time. Either way, whatever, you're going to grab a couple pressure cables and then you're going to prime the bag, which we'll have guidance on that. I think we have in the hemodynamics lecture, you can check out the hemodynamics lecture for all of that fun stuff. But then as you are helping in the CCA membership, yes, that's in the membership, that lecture. And so the provider is going to place and float the swan as they are floating the swan gains catheter they're probably going to ask you for help um because the they are essentially threading this long catheter it's like 110 centimeters or um yeah centimeters right 100 <laughs> 110 centimeters they are threading it through the heart and they are using you to go up and down with the balloon. So you wanna be very good at closed loop communication with this. So they're going to say something along the lines of balloon up or inflate or however they say it. And then you wanna repeat that verbatim back to them. Balloon is up or balloon is inflated. You're using really tight closed loop communication here because safety is really important especially during this procedure. Again, because it's it's kind of high risk. Like patients really sick if they need it at baseline and there is a risk for causing injury to the heart. So you want to make sure you're using closed loop communication. Like one like quick like thing yes. to add in here is like okay, so as a nurse like why does it matter? Like why is the balloon inflated on the way in and like deflate like why are we inflating and deflating the balloon? We inflate the balloon on the way in so that it allows us to pass through valves. We're gently pushing open the tricuspid valve so we can float between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And then again, to get into our um, RV output track and into our pulmonary artery, we cross the pulmonary valve. Um, so we cross two valves. And so having the balloon open kind of allows us to like gently push those track doors open, right? But you can imagine if sometimes like, the swan gets coiled, like it kind of starts to tie itself in a knot, it gets like lost in the right ventricle a little bit, or like it doesn't really quite get to where we want it to go on the first try. So we need to pull back, we need to withdraw the catheter, that way we don't loop it in a full knot. Whenever we're pulling back, we need the balloon down because if you pull a balloon against a closed valve backwards, you're going to damage the valve. The valve is supposed to open in one direction only, not not two directions, right? So you don't want to tear that tissue. So it's really important for us to trust the person who's inflating the syringe for us and know that they hear us and repeat back to us what they're doing. Um, and it's also important for you to know, you know, what's happening so that you can make suggestions in case they get tunnel vision and miss it. Like maybe this is a resident who's doing it or a fellow who's only done it like a few times, or maybe they're like flustered or there's a lot of chaos going on. If you see that they're saying, oh, I think it's coiled, I'm gonna pull back, and they start to pull back, and they haven't asked you to put the balloon down yet, now's the time to speak up and say, hey, did you want me to take the balloon down? And they'll go, oh, oh my God, yeah, 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 thank you so much. Like th These are like important safety tips for you. 100%. Why are they doing what they're doing? One more, I think this is the last thing on tip number five. So we talk, again, in the um, Confident Care Academy membership a lot about the conduction of the heart and the what is happening at the cellular level to have the electrical current, the conduction, all of this good stuff. So as the swan is being floated, there is a chance, and then again, the patient, if they're post open heart surgery, they also have all of these inflammatory factors that are happening. You are sometimes like tickling the heart and then causing some temporary arrhythmias, which is typically transient and typically like fairly harmless, even if they go into a temporary ventricular arrhythmia. But Chrissy was really good at explaining why if they have an AV block, you do need to be more careful and just be watchful as you're placing the swan. If you want to talk about that a little bit more, Chrissy. Yeah, sure. So like mostly what you'll see when we're in the, the right ventricle, you'll almost always see a couple runs mm -hmm. of VTAC. You'll see like a five beat run of VTAC, a 10 beat run of VTAC. And like, again, super transient, like Anna said. Um, but if the patient already has a bundle branch block, 
we could, as we're loading the catheter, in theory, again, this is like pretty rare, but you can cause a bundle branch block, right? Like what is the what are the bundle branches? We have the SA node that's like in like the right atrium, <laughs> then we have the AV node and the bundle hiss that like connects the conduction from the top of the heart to the bottom of the heart, and then it breaks off into two bundle branches, the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch, and then that goes out into the ventricles, into the Purkinje system. So these little branches are like this. When you are floating through this area, we could, in theory, cause some damage and cause a bundle branch block. And if your patient already has a bundle branch block, so wait, so I guess, so let me think about this for a second. So we could cause a right bundle branch block. And if your patient already has a left bundle branch block, a bundle branch block on the opposite side, you now have both fascicles blocked, you now are going to develop a complete heart block or you're a very high risk for developing a complete heart block because there is no longer communication between the top of the heart and the bottom of the heart. So for this reason, we should have Zoll pads in the room. In my personal opinion, I don't think you need to bring in the code card. I don't think you have to have them on the patient like hooked up unless maybe again, the patient already has a bundle branch block in place. Like that might be an exception to the rule. But um, yeah, just know where they are, have them in the room and have like a charge nurse and like some senior nurses around, like know the procedure that you're doing. So like when you need help, it's there for you. Um, but you wanna be prepared for that. We're again, like we're not so much freaking out over the five feet run of VTAC because it almost never really results in anything. Um, but like being aware that we can cause some new bundle break blocks is like the safety factor to be aware. Very key. And then you'll just get an x-ray also after to confirm placement, even though you already wedged. You always want to make sure that you order or that the provider team has ordered an x-ray. And then now you know almost everything except uh, waveforms and uh, and tamponade, all of which we get into in the main lecture. So if you want more, check out the main lecture. But this was really fun, I think, to kind of casually talk about and demystify and give some tips about just a pretty scary, invasive piece of equipment and just talking about it more. I think the more education, the better, you know? If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe so that we can bring you more of these. Um, if you want to know more about Swan Gans catheter specifically, like Anna said, definitely check out the Confident Care Academy membership. Our website is linked below. It's also in our profile. It's confidentcareacademy.com. There you're going to get a lot more information about SVO2 and pictures of the different waveforms and what happens when the patients go into diff different arrhythmias as well. You can also follow our podcast and rate our podcast, give it five stars on all podcast platforms. And please comment what you would like for us to talk about next time. We're excited to do these hopefully weekly deep dives into all of these different nursing topics. And we're so excited to get started in 2023. Thanks for your support.